The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 1, Side 2. Raised in poverty at Sarzana, Tommaso Parentuccelli somehow found means to attend the University of Bologna for six years. When his funds ran out, he went to Florence and served as tutor in the homes of Rinaldo degli Albizzi and Palla di Strozzi. His purse replenished, he returned to Bologna, continued his studies, and received at twenty-two the doctorate in theology. Niccolò degli Albergati, Archbishop of Bologna, made him controller of the archiepiscopal household and took him to Florence to attend Eugenius IV in the Pope's long exile there. In these Florentine years, the priest became a humanist without ceasing to be a Christian. He developed a warm friendship with Bruni, Marzupini, Manetti, Arispa, and Poggio, and joined their literary gatherings. Soon, Thomas of Sarzana, as the humanists called him, was aflame with their passion for classical antiquity. He spent almost all his income on books, borrowed money to buy costly manuscripts, and expressed the hope that some day his funds would suffice to gather into one library all the great books in the world. In that ambition, the Vatican Library had its origin. Cosimo engaged him to catalogue the Martian Library, and Tommaso was happy among the manuscripts. He could hardly know that he was preparing himself to be the first Renaissance Pope. For twenty years he served Albergati in Florence and Bologna. When the bishop died in 1443, Eugenius appointed Parentuccelli to succeed him. And three years later the Pope, impressed by his learning, his piety, and his administrative ability, made him a cardinal. Another year passed. Eugenius passed away, and the cardinals, deadlocked between the Orsini and Colonna factions, raised Parentuccelli to the papacy. Who would have thought, he exclaimed to Vespasiano da Bistici, that a poor bell-ringer of a priest would be made pope to the confusion of the proud? The humanists of Italy rejoiced, and one of them, Francesco Barbaro, proclaimed that Plato's vision had come true. A philosopher had become king. Nicholas V, as he now called himself, had three aims, to be a good pope, to rebuild Rome, and to restore classical literature, learning, and art. He conducted his high office with modesty and competence, gave audience at almost any hour of the day, and managed to get along amicably with both Germany and France. The anti-pope Felix V, realizing that Nicholas would soon win all Latin Christendom to his allegiance, resigned his pretensions and was gracefully forgiving. The rebellious but disintegrating Council of Basel moved to Lausanne and dissolved in 1449. The conciliar movement was ended, the papal schism was healed. Demands for reform of the Church still came from beyond the Alps. Nicholas felt incapable of achieving that reform in the face of all the office holders who would lose by it. Instead, he hoped that the Church would regain, as the leader in the revival of learning, the prestige that she had lost at Avignon and in the schism. Not that his support of scholarship was motivated by political ends. It was a sincere, almost an amorous passion. He had made arduous trips over the Alps in search of manuscripts. It was he who had unearthed at Basel the works of Tertullian. Now, dowered with the revenues of the papacy, he sent agents to Athens, Constantinople, and divers cities in Germany and England to seek and buy or copy Greek or Latin manuscripts, pagan or Christian. He installed a large corps of copyists and editors in the Vatican. He called almost every prominent humanist in Italy to Rome. All the scholars in the world, wrote Vespasiano, in fond exaggeration, came to Rome in the time of Pope Nicholas, partly of their own accord, partly at his request. He rewarded their work with the liberality of a caliph thrilled by music or poetry. The subdued Lorenzo Valla received five hundred ducats, or about twelve thousand five hundred dollars, for putting Thucydides into Latin dress. Guarino da Verona received fifteen hundred ducats for translating Strabo. Niccolò Perotti, five hundred for Polybius. Poggio was put to translating Diodorus Siculus. Theodorus Gaza was lured from Ferrara to make a new translation of Aristotle. Filelfo was offered a house in Rome, an estate in the country, 
and ten thousand ducats to render into Latin the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Pope's death, however, prevented the execution of this Homeric enterprise. These rewards were so great that some scholars, mirabile dictu, hesitated to accept them. The Pope overcame their scruples by playfully warning them, Don't refuse. You may not find another Nicholas. When an epidemic drove him from Rome to Fabriano, he took his translators and copyists with him, lest any of them should succumb to the plague. Meanwhile, he did not neglect what might be called the Christian classics. He offered five thousand ducats to anyone who would bring him the Gospel of St. Matthew in the original tongue. He engaged Gianozzo Manetti and George of Trebizond to translate Cyril, Basil, Gregory Nazianzen, Gregory of Nyssa, and other patrological literature. He commissioned Manetti and aides to make a new version of the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek. This, too, was frustrated by his death. These Latin translations were hurried and imperfect, but they for the first time opened Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, Polybius, Diodorus, Appian, Philo, and Theophrastus to students who could not read Greek. Referring to these translations, Philelfo wrote, Greece has not perished, but has migrated to Italy, which in former days was called Greater Greece. Manetti, with greater gratitude than accuracy, calculated that more Greek authors were translated during the eight years of Nicholas's pontificate than in all the preceding five centuries. Nicholas loved the appearance and form as well as the contents of books. Himself, a calligraphist, he had his translations written carefully upon parchment by expert scribes. The leaves were bound in crimson velvet, secured by silver clasps. As the number of his books mounted, finally to 824 Latin and 352 Greek manuscripts, and these were added to previous papal collections, the problem arose of housing the 5,000 volumes, the largest store of books in Christendom, in such a way that their complete transmission to posterity might be assured. The construction of a Vatican library was one of Nicholas's dearest dreams. He was a builder as well as a scholar, and from the outset of his pontificate he had resolved to make Rome worthy of leading the world. A jubilee year was at hand in 1450. A hundred thousand visitors were expected. They must not find Rome a shabby ruin. The prestige of the church and the papacy required that the citadel of Christianity should confront pilgrims with noble edifices combining taste and beauty with noble proportions, which would immensely conduce to the exaltation of the chair of St. Peter. So Nicholas, on his deathbed, apologetically explained his aim. He restored the walls and gates of the city, repaired the Aqua Vergine aqueduct, and had an artist construct an ornamental fountain at its mouth. He engaged Leon Battista Alberti to design palaces, public squares, and spacious avenues shielded from sun and rain by arcaded porticos. He had many streets paved, many bridges renewed, the Castle of Sant'Angelo repaired. He lent money to prominent citizens to help them build palaces that would be an ornament to Rome. At his bidding, Bernardo Rossellino renovated Santa Maria Maggiore, San Giovanni Laterano, San Paolo and San Lorenzo Fuori le Mura, outside the walls, and the forty churches that Gregory I had designated as Stations of the Cross. He made majestic plans for a new Vatican palace that, with its gardens, would cover all the Vatican Hill and would house the Pope and his staff, the cardinals, and the administrative offices of the Curia. He lived to complete his own chambers, later occupied by Alexander VI and called the Appartamento Borgia, the library, now the Pinacoteca Vaticana, and the rooms or stanze later decorated by Raphael. He brought Benedetto Bonfigli from Perugia and Andrea del Castagno from Florence to paint frescoes, now lost, on the Vatican walls and he persuaded the aging Fra Angelico to return to Rome and paint in the Pope's own chapel the stories of St. Stephen and St. Lawrence. He planned to tear down the old and crumbling Basilica of St. Peter and raise over the Apostle's tomb the most imposing church in the world. It was left for Julius II to take up this audacious aim. All this, he hoped, could be financed from the proceeds of the Jubilee. Nicholas announced this as a celebration of the restored peace and unity of the church and the sentiment went well with the peoples of Europe. The migration of pilgrims from every quarter of Latin Christendom was of unprecedented magnitude. Eyewitnesses compared it to the movement of myriads of ants. 
The crowding in Rome was so extreme that the Pope limited to five, then three, then two days, the maximum length of any visitor's stay. On one occasion, two hundred persons were killed in a crush that swept many into the Tiber. Nicholas thereafter tore down houses to widen the approaches to St. Peter's. As the pilgrims brought rich offerings, the financial returns from the Jubilee exceeded even the Pope's expectations and covered the expense of his new buildings and his outlay for scholars and manuscripts. The other cities of Italy suffered a shortage of money because, a Perugian complained, it all flowed into Rome. But in Rome, the innkeepers, money changers, and tradesmen profited hugely, and Nicholas was able to deposit 100,000 florins, or about two and a half million dollars, in the bank of the Medici alone. The countries beyond the Alps rumbled with discontent at the efflux of gold into Italy. Even in Rome, some disaffection troubled the new prosperity. Nicholas's government of the city was enlightened and just from his point of view, and he had made a concession to Republican hopes by nominating four citizens who were to appoint all municipal officials and control all taxes levied in the city. But the senators and nobles whose class had ruled Rome during the Avignon papacy and the schism fretted under the papal government, and the populace resented the transformation of the Vatican into a palace fortress secure against such assaults as had driven Eugenius from Rome. The Republican ideas preached by Arnold of Brescia and Cola di Rienzo still agitated many minds. In the year of Nicholas's accession, a leading burgher, Stefano Porcaro, made a fiery speech demanding the restoration of self-government. Nicholas sent him into comfortable exile as Podesta of Anagni, but Porcaro found his way back to the capital and raised the cry of liberty before an excited carnival crowd. Nicholas banished him to Bologna, but left him full freedom except for the necessity of daily showing himself to the papal legate there. Nevertheless, the undiscourageable Stefano managed, from Bologna, to organize a complicated plot among three hundred of his followers in Rome. On the Feast of the Epiphany, while the Pope and the Cardinals were at Mass in St. Peter's, an attack was to be made on the Vatican, its treasury was to be seized to provide funds for establishing a republic, and Nicholas himself was to be taken prisoner. Porcaro secretly left Bologna on December 26, 1452, and joined the conspirators on the eve of the planned attack. But his absence from Bologna was noted, and a courier brought warning to the Vatican. Stefano was traced, bound, and imprisoned, and on January 9th he was beheaded at Sant'Angelo. The Republicans denounced the execution as murder. The humanists condemned the plot as monstrous infidelity to a benevolent pope. Nicholas was shaken and changed by the discovery that a large section of the citizenry looked upon him as a despot, however benevolent. Harrowed with suspicion, embittered by resentment, tortured by gout, he aged rapidly. When news came to him that the Turks had entered Constantinople over the corpses of 50,000 Christians and had turned St. Sophia into a mosque in 1453, all the glory of his pontificate seemed a fitful vanity. He appealed to the European powers to join in a crusade to recapture the fallen citadel of Eastern Christianity. He called for a tenth of all the revenue of Western Europe to finance the effort, and pledged a tenth of papal, curial, and other ecclesiastical revenues. And all war between Christian nations was to cease on pain of excommunication. Europe hardly listened. People complained that money raised by previous popes for crusades had been used for other purposes— Venice preferred a commercial entente with the Turks. Milan took advantage of Venetian difficulties by retaking Brescia. Florence looked with satisfaction on Venice's loss of eastern trade. Nicholas bowed to reality, and the lust of life cooled in his veins. Worn out with feudal diplomacy and punished for the sins of his predecessors, he died in 1455 at the age of 58. He had restored peace within the church, he had restored order and splendor to Rome, he had founded the greatest of libraries, he had reconciled the church and the Renaissance. He had kept his hands free from war, had avoided nepotism, had struggled to turn Italy from suicidal strife. Amid unprecedented revenues, he himself had led a simple life, loving the church and his books, and extravagant only in his gifts. A grieving chronicler expressed the feeling of Italy when he described the scholar-pope as wise, just, benevolent, gracious, peaceable, affectionate, charitable, humble, endowed with every virtue. 
It was the verdict of love, and poor Caro might have demurred, but we may let it stand. 3. Calixtus the Third, 1455-1458 The disunion of Italy determined the papal election that followed. The factions, unable to agree on an Italian, chose a Spanish cardinal, Alfonso Borgia, who took the name of Calixtus III. He was already seventy-seven. He could be depended upon to die soon, and allow the cardinals another and perhaps more profitable choice. A specialist in canon law and diplomacy, he had a legalistic mind, and cared little for the classical scholarship that had enamored Nicholas. The humanists, who had no indigenous root in Rome, languished during his pontificate, except that Vala, now quite reformed, was still a papal secretary. Calixtus was a good man who loved his relatives. Ten months after his coronation, he raised to the cardinalate two of his nephews, Luis Juan de Mila and Rodrigo Borgia, and Don Jaime of Portugal, respectively twenty-five, twenty-four, and twenty-three years of age. Rodrigo, the future Alexander VI, had the additional handicap of being carelessly candid about his mistresses. However, Calixtus gave him, in 1457, the most lucrative post at the papal court, that of vice-chancellor. In the same year, he made him also commander-in-chief of the papal troops. So began, or grew, the nepotism by which pope after pope gave church offices to his nephews or other relatives, who were sometimes his sons. To the anger of the Italians, Calixtus surrounded himself with men of his own country. Rome was now ruled by Catalans. The Pope had reasons. He was a foreigner in Rome. The nobles and republicans were plotting against him. He wished to have near him men whom he knew, and who could protect him from intrigue while he attended to his prime interest, a crusade. Moreover, the Pope was resolved to have friends in a college of cardinals perpetually struggling to make the papacy a constitutional as well as an elective monarchy, subject in all its decisions to the cardinals as a senate or privy council. The Pope opposed and overcame this movement precisely as the kings fought and defeated the nobles. In each case, absolute monarchy won, but perhaps the replacement of a local with a national economy and the growth of international relations in scope and complexity required for the time a centralization of leadership and authority. Calixtus wore out his last energies in a vain attempt to stir Europe to resist the Turks. When he died, Rome celebrated the end of its rule by barbarians. When Cardinal Piccolomini was named his successor, Rome rejoiced as it had not rejoiced over any pope during the last two hundred years. 4. Pius II, 1458-1464 to 1464. Enea Silvio de Piccolomini began his career in 1405 in the town of Corsignano, near Siena, of poor parents with a noble pedigree. The University of Siena taught him law, it was not to his taste, for he loved literature, but it gave keenness and order to his mind and prepared him for the tasks of administration and diplomacy. At Florence he studied the humanities under Filelfo, and from that time he remained a humanist. At twenty-seven he was engaged as secretary by Cardinal Caprinica, whom he accompanied to the Council of Basel. There he fell in with a group hostile to Eugenius IV. For many years thereafter he defended the conciliar movement against the papal power. For a time he served as secretary to the antipope Felix V. Perceiving that he had hitched his wagon to a falling star, he coaxed a bishop to introduce him to the emperor Frederick III. Soon he received a post in the royal chancery, and in 1442 he accompanied Frederick to Austria. For a while he remained moored. In those formative years he seemed quite formless, merely a clever climber who had no sturdy principles, no goal but success. He passed from cause to cause without losing his heart, and from woman to woman with a gay inconstancy that seemed to him, and to most of his contemporaries, the proper training for the obligations of matrimony. He wrote for a friend a love letter designed to melt the obstinacy of a girl who preferred marriage to fornication. Of his several illegitimate children he sent one to his father, asking him to rear it, and confessing that he was neither holier than David nor wiser than Solomon. The young devil could quote scripture to his purpose. He wrote a novel in the manner of Boccaccio. It was translated into almost every European tongue, and plagued him in the days of his sanctity. Though his further advancement seemed to require taking holy orders, he shrank from the step because, 
Like Augustine, he doubted his capacity for continence. He wrote against the celibacy of the clergy. Amid these infidelities, he remained faithful to letters. That same sensitivity to beauty which had corrupted his morals, enamored him of nature, delighted him with travel, and formed his style until he had made himself one of the most engaging writers and eloquent orators of the fifteenth century. He wrote, nearly always in Latin, in nearly every species of composition, fiction, poetry, epigrams, dialogues, essays, histories, travel sketches, geography, commentaries, memoirs, a comedy, and always with a verve and grace that rivaled Petrarch's liveliest prose. He could phrase a state paper, prepare or improvise an address, with persuasive subtlety and captivating fluency. It is characteristic of the age that Aeneas Silvius, beginning almost from nothing, raised himself to the papacy on the point of his pen. His verses had no enduring depth or worth, but they were smooth enough to get him the poet's crown from the hand of the complacent Frederick III in 1442. His essays had a light-hearted charm that glossed over their author's lack of conviction or principle. He could pass from a discourse on the miseries of court life, as rivers flow to the sea, so vices flow to courts, to a treatise on the nature and care of horses. It was another sign of the times that at his long letter on education, addressed to King Ladislaus of Bohemia but intended for publication, quoted, with one exception, only pagan authors and instances, stressed the glory of humanistic studies, and urged the king to fit his sons for the hardships and responsibilities of war. Serious matters are settled not by laws, but by arms. His travel notes are the best of their kind in Renaissance literature. He described with avid interest not only cities and rural scenes, but industries, products, political conditions, constitutions, manners, and morals. And not since Petrarch had any Italian written so fondly well of the countryside. He was the only Italian in centuries who loved Germany. He had a good word for the boisterous burghers who filled the air with song and themselves with beer, instead of murdering one another in the streets. He called himself Varia Videndi Cupidus, eager to see a variety of things. And one of his frequent sayings was, A miser is never satisfied with his money, nor a wise man with his knowledge. Turning his facile plume to history, he composed short biographies of illustrious contemporaries, De Viris Claris, A Life of Frederick III, An Account of the Hussite Wars, and An Outline of Universal History. He planned a larger universal history and geography, continued to work on it during his pontificate, and completed the section on Asia, which Columbus read with interest. As Pope, he composed from day to day commentarii, or memoirs, giving the history of his reign to his final illness. He read and dictated till midnight as he lay in bed, says his contemporary Platina, nor did he sleep above five or six hours. He apologized for giving papal time to literary composition. Our time has not been taken from our duties. We have given to writing the hours due to sleep. We have robbed our old age of its rest, that we might hand down to posterity all that we know to be memorable. In 1445, the emperor sent Aeneas Silvius as envoy to the pope. He, who had a hundred times written against Eugenius, made his apologies so eloquently that the kindly pontiff readily forgave him, and from that day the soul of Aeneas belonged to Eugenius. He became a priest in 1446, and at forty-one reconciled himself to chastity. Henceforth he lived an exemplary life. He kept Frederick loyal to the papacy, and by skillful, sometimes devious diplomacy, restored the allegiance of the German electors and prelates to the apostolic see. His visits to Rome and Siena reawakened his love of Italy. Gradually he loosened his ties with Frederick and attached himself in 1455 to the papal court. He had always wanted to be back in the excitement and politics of his native land. In Rome he would be at the very center of things. Who could say but in the tumult and shuffle of events he might not become pope? In 1449 he was made Bishop of Siena. In 1456 he became Cardinal Piccolomini. When the time came to choose a successor to Calixtus, the Italians in the conclave, to prevent the election of the French Cardinal de Tudeville, gave their votes to Piccolomini. The Italian cardinals were resolved to keep the papacy and the sacred college Italian, not only for their personal reasons, but through fear that a non-Italian pope 
might again disrupt Christendom by favoring his own country or taking the papacy from Italy. No one held against Aeneas the sins of his youth. The merry Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia cast a decisive vote for him. The majority felt that Cardinal Piccolomini, though so recently capped in red, had the qualifications of a man of wide experience, a successful diplomat well posted on troublesome Germany, and a scholar whose learning would heighten the luster of the papacy. He was now fifty-three, and his adventurous life had taken such toll of his health that he seemed already an old man. On a voyage from Holland to Scotland in 1435, he had encountered frighteningly rough seas, taking twelve days from Slois to Dunbar, and had vowed, if saved, to walk barefoot to the nearest shrine of the Virgin. This proved to be at Whitekirk, ten miles away. He kept his vow, walked the full distance with bare feet on snow and ice, contracted gout, and suffered severely from it all the rest of his life. By 1458 he had stone in the kidneys and a chronic cough. His eyes were sunken, his face pale. At times, says Plotina, nobody could tell that he was alive but by his voice. As Pope he lived simply and frugally. His household expenses in the Vatican were the lowest on record. When his duties allowed, he retired to a rural suburb, where he entertained himself not like a pope, but as an honest, humble rustic. Sometimes he held consistories or received ambassadors under shady trees, or amid an olive grove, or by a cooling spring or stream. He called himself, punning on his name, Silvarum Amator, lover of woods. As pope, he took his name from Virgil's recurrent phrase, Pius Aeneas. If we may with custom moderately mistranslate the adjective, he lived up to it. He was pious, faithful to his duties, benevolent and indulgent, temperate and mild, and won the affection of even the cynics of Rome. He had outgrown the sensualism of his youth and was morally a model pope. He made no attempt to conceal his early amours or his propaganda for the councils against the papacy, but he issued a bull of retraction in 1463, humbly asking God and the Church to forgive his errors and sins. The humanists, who had expected lavish patronage from a humanist pope, were disappointed to find that while he enjoyed their company and gave several of them places in the curia, he dispensed no luscious fees but conserved the papal funds for a crusade against the Turks. He continued in his leisure moments to be a humanist. He studied the ancient ruins carefully and forbade their further demolition. He amnestied the people of Arpino because Cicero had been born there. He commissioned a new translation of Homer, and employed Plotina and Biondo in his secretariat. He brought Mino da Fiesole to carve and Filippino Lippi to paint in the churches of Rome. He indulged his vanity by building, from designs by Bernardo Rossellino, a cathedral and Piccolomini Palace in his native Corsignano, which he renamed Pienza after himself. He had the poor noble's pride of ancestry and was too loyal to his friends and relatives for the good of the church. The Vatican became a Piccolomini hive. Two admirable scholars graced his pontificate. Flavio Biondo, a papal secretary since Nicholas V, was a symbol of the Christian Renaissance. He loved antiquity and spent half his life describing its history and relics, but he never ceased to be a devout, orthodox, and practicing Christian. Pius valued him as guide and friend, and profited from his company on tours of the Roman remains. For Biondo had written an encyclopedia in three parts, Roma Instaurata, Roma Triumphans, and Italia Illustrata, recording the topography, history, institutions, laws, religion, manners, and arts of ancient Italy. Greater still was his Historarium ab Inclinatione Romanorum, an immense decline and fall of the Roman Empire, from 476 to 1250, the first critical history of the Middle Ages. Biondo was no stylist, but he was a discriminating historian. Through his work, the legends that Italian cities had cherished of their Trojan or like-fancied origins died away. The undertaking was too ambitious even for Biondo's seventy-five years. It was unfinished at his death in 1463, but it set to later historians an example of conscientious scholarship. John Cardinal Bessarion was a living vehicle of the Greek culture that was entering Italy. Born at Trebizond, he received at Constantinople a thorough schooling in Greek poetry, oratory, and philosophy. He continued his studies under the famous Platonist Gemistus Pletho 
at Mistra. Coming to the Council of Florence as Archbishop of Nicaea, he took a leading part in the reunion of Greek and Latin Christianity. Returning to Constantinople, he and other Uniates were repudiated by the lower clergy and the people. Pope Eugenius made him a cardinal in 1439, and Bessarion moved to Italy, bringing with him a rich collection of Greek manuscripts. At Rome, his house became a salon of humanists. Poggio, Valla, and Platina were among his closest friends. Valla called him Latinorum Graecissimus, Graecorum Latinissimus, the most learned Hellenist among the Latins, the most accomplished Latinist among the Greeks. He spent nearly all his income in purchasing manuscripts or having them copied. He himself made a new translation of Aristotle's Metaphysics. But as a disciple of Gemistus, he favored Plato and led the Platonic camp in a hot controversy that raged at the time between Platonists and Aristotelians. Plato won that campaign, and the long rule of Aristotle over Western philosophy came to an end. When Nicholas V appointed Bessarion legate at Bologna to govern the Romagna and the Marches, Bessarion acquitted himself so well that Nicholas called him Angel of Peace. For Pius II, he undertook difficult diplomatic missions in a Germany again seething with revolt against the Roman Church. Toward the end of his life, he bequeathed his library to Venice, where it now forms a precious part of the Bibliotheca Marciana. In 1471, he narrowly missed election to the papacy. He died a year later, honored throughout the world of scholarship. His missions to Germany failed, partly because the efforts of Pius II to reform the church were frustrated, and partly because a new attempt to levy a tithe for a crusade revived transalpine antipathy to Rome. At the outset of his pontificate, Pius appointed a committee of high prelates to formulate a program of reform. He accepted a plan submitted by Nicholas of Cusa and embodied it in a papal bull, but he found that no one in Rome wanted reform. Almost every second dignitary there profited from one or another immemorial abuse. Apathy and passive resistance defeated Pius, and meanwhile his difficulties with Germany, Bohemia, and France used up his energy, and the crusade that he planned absorbed his devotion and cried for funds. He had to content himself with reproving cardinals for licentious lives and with sporadic improvements of monastic discipline. In 1463, he addressed a final appeal to the cardinals. People say that we live for pleasure, accumulate wealth, bear ourselves arrogantly, ride on fat mules and handsome palfreys, trail the fringes of our cloaks after us, and show round plump faces beneath the red hat and the white hood, keep hounds for the chase, spend much on actors and parasites, and nothing in defense of the faith. And there is some truth in their words— Many among the cardinals and other officials of our court do lead this kind of life. If the truth be confessed, the luxury and pomp at our court is too great, and this is why we are so detested by the people that they will not listen to us, even when we say what is just and reasonable. What do you think is to be done in such a shameful state of things? We must inquire by what means our predecessors won authority and consideration for the Church. We must maintain that authority by the same means." Temperance, chastity, innocence, zeal for the faith, contempt of earth, the desire for martyrdom, have exalted the Roman Church and made her mistress of the world. The Pope, who as Aeneas Silvius had been so uniformly successful as a diplomat, had to bear one setback after another in his dealings with the European powers. Louis XI gave him a brief triumph by revoking the pragmatic sanction of Bourges, but when Pius refused to aid the House of Anjou in its plans for recapturing Naples, Louis in effect revoked his revocation. Bohemia persisted in the revolt that John Hus had started. The Reformation had begun there a century before Luther, and the new king, George Podiebrad, was giving it his powerful support. The German hierarchy continued to league with German princes in resisting collection of the tithe, and renewed the old cry for a general council to reform the church and sit in judgment upon the Pope. Pius responded by issuing in 1460 the bull Execrabilis, which condemned and forbade any attempt to convene a general council without papal initiative and consent. If, he argued, such a council could be summoned at any time by opponents of papal policy, papal jurisdiction would be in constant jeopardy and ecclesiastical discipline would be paralyzed. These disputes fettered the efforts of the Pope to unify Europe against the Turks. 
On the very day of his coronation, he expressed his horror at the advance of the Moslems along the Danube to Vienna and through the Balkans into Bosnia. Greece, Epirus, Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia were falling to the enemies of Christianity. Who could say when they would leap across the Adriatic into Italy? A month after his coronation, Pius issued an invitation to all Christian princes to join him in a great congress at Mantua and lay plans to rescue Eastern Christendom from the Ottoman tide. He himself arrived there on May 27, 1459. Arrayed in the most gorgeous vestments of his office, he was borne through the city on a litter held up by the nobles and vassals of the church. He addressed great throngs in one of the most moving orations of his career. But no king or prince came from beyond the Alps, and none sent representatives with powers to commit his state to war. Nationalism, which was to achieve the Reformation, was already strong enough to make the papacy an ineffectual suppliant before the thrones of the kings. The cardinals urged the Pope to return to Rome. Neither did they relish the thought of yielding a tithe of their income to the crusade. Some decamped to their pleasures. Some asked Pius to his face did he wish them to die of fever in Mantua's summer heat. The pontiff waited patiently for the emperor, but Frederick III, instead of coming to the aid of the man who in the past had served him well, declared war on Hungary in an effort to add to his realm the very nation that was most actively preparing to resist the Turks. France again made its cooperation conditional on papal support of a French campaign against Naples. Venice held back for fear that her remaining possessions in the Aegean would be the first sacrifice in a war of Christian Europe against the Ottomans. At last, in August, an embassy came from Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy. In September, Francesco Sforza appeared. Other Italian princes followed his lead, and on the 26th, the Congress held its first sitting, four months after the arrival of the Pope. Four months more passed in argument. Finally, by agreeing to the division of Turkish and formerly Byzantine territory in Europe among the victorious powers, Pius won Burgundy and Italy to his plan for a holy war. All Christian laymen were to contribute to the cause a thirtieth of their income, all Jews a twentieth, all clergy a tenth. The Pope returned to Rome in almost complete exhaustion, but he gave orders for the construction of a papal fleet and prepared, despite gout and cough and stone, to lead the crusade himself. And yet his nature shrank from war, and he dreamed of a peaceful victory. Perhaps encouraged by rumors that Mohammed II, born of a Christian mother, had secret leanings toward Christianity, Pius addressed to the Sultan in 1461 an earnest appeal to accept the gospel of Christ. He had never been more eloquent. Were you to embrace Christianity, there is no prince on earth who would surpass you in glory or equal you in power. We would acknowledge you as emperor of the Greeks and the East, and what you have now taken by violence and retained by injustice would then be your lawful possession. Oh, what a fullness of peace it would be! The golden age of Augustus, sung by the poets, would return. If you were to join yourself to us, the whole of the East would soon turn to Christ. One will could give peace to the entire world, and that will is yours. Mohammed made no reply. Whatever his theology, he knew that his final protection against Western arms lay not in the promises of the Pope, but in the religious ardor of his people. Pius turned more realistically to collecting the clerical tithe. A windfall sustained him in 1462 when rich deposits of alum were found in papal soil at Tolfa in western Latium. Several thousand men were put to work mining the substance so valued by dyers. Soon the mines were yielding 100,000 florins per year to the Holy See. Pius announced that the discovery was a miracle, a divine contribution to the Turkish war. The Papal States were now the richest government in Italy, with Venice a close second, Naples third, then Milan, Florence, Modena, Siena, Mantua. Venice, perceiving the resolute earnestness of the Pope, accelerated its preparations. The other powers held back or offered merely token aid. The collection of taxes for the crusade met with formidable resistance almost everywhere. Francesco Sforza cooled to the enterprise as promising to strengthen Venice by redeeming her lost possessions and trade. Genoa, which had pledged eight triremes, withheld them. The Duke of Burgundy urged the Pope to wait for a better day. But Pius announced that he would go to Ancona, expect there the union of new papal and Venetian fleets, cross with them to Ragusa, 
joined Skanderbeg of Bosnia and Matthias Corvinus of Hungary, and lead in person the advance against the Turks. Nearly all the cardinals protested. They had no appetite for marching through the Balkans. They warned the Pope that Bosnia was reeking with heretics and plague. The ailing pontiff nevertheless took the cross of a crusader, bade farewell to Rome, not expecting to see it again, and sailed with his fleet for Ancona on June 18, 1464. Meanwhile, the armies that were supposed to meet him faded away as if by oriental magic. The troops originally promised by Milan did not come. Those which Florence sent were so poorly equipped as to be useless. When Pius reached Ancona on July 19th, he found that most of the crusaders who had assembled there had deserted, weary of waiting and worried for food. Plague broke out in the Venetian fleet as it left the lagoons and caused a delay of twelve days. Broken-hearted by the vanishing of his armies and the non-appearance of the Venetian armada, Pius languished at Ancona, sick to the verge of death. Finally, the fleet was sighted. The Pope sent his galleys to meet them, and had himself carried to a window from which he could see the harbor. As the combined navies came in sight, he died on August 14, 1464. Venice recalled her vessels, the remaining soldiers dispersed, the crusade collapsed. The brilliant and versatile climber who had graved success after success had reached the throne of thrones, had graced it with her Bain scholarship and Christian benevolence, and had drunk to the dregs the gall of failure, humiliation, and defeat. But he had redeemed the errors of his youth with the devotion of his maturity, and had shamed the cynicism of his peers with the nobility of his death. 5. Paul II, 1464-1471 The lives of great men oft remind us that a man's character can be formed after his demise. If a ruler coddles the chroniclers about him, they may lift him to posthumous sanctity. If he offends them, they may broil his corpse on a spit of venom, or roast him to darkest infamy in a pot of ink. Paul II quarreled with Plotina. Plotina wrote the biography upon which most estimates of Paul depend, and handed him down to posterity as a monster of vanity, pomp, and greed. There was some truth in the indictment, though not much more than might be found in any biography untempered with charity. Pietro Barbo, Cardinal of San Marco, was proud of his handsome appearance, as nearly all men are. When elected Pope, he proposed, probably in humor, to be called Formosus, good-looking. He allowed himself to be dissuaded and took the title of Paul II. Simple in his private life, yet knowing the hypnotic effect of magnificence, he kept a luxurious court and entertained his friends and guests with costly hospitality. On entering the conclave that elected him, he, like the other cardinals, had pledged himself, if chosen, to wage war against the Turks— to summon a general council, to limit the number of cardinals to twenty-four and the number of papal relatives among them to one, and to create no man a cardinal under thirty years of age, and to consult the cardinals on all important appointments. Paul, elected, repudiated these capitulations as nullifying time-honored traditions and powers. He consoled the cardinals by raising their yearly revenue to a minimum of four thousand florins, or about a hundred thousand dollars. He himself, coming of a mercantile family, relished the security of florins, ducats, scudi, and gems that held a fortune in a ray of light. He wore a tiara that outweighed a palace in worth. As cardinal, he had kept the goldsmiths busy with orders for jewels, medals, and cameos. These and costly relics of classic art he had collected in the sumptuous Palazzo San Marco, which he had built for himself at the foot of the capital. With all his acquisitiveness he stooped to no simony, repressed the sale of indulgences, and governed Rome with justice, if not with mercy. He is worst remembered by his quarrel with the Roman humanists. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1.